Well, I'm glad to be here and upright. I was released yesterday at about 11. Um, we had a string of appointments this week, but God has been good. On Wednesday, I went for a cystoscopy for my bladder, and she says I'm clear, no cancer, so that's amazing. And that was a long, hard road, but I'm glad. And also, I have a bladder, a twin bladder friend. <laughs> Kelly's also gone through bladder cancer, but she's also clear. And then on Friday, I went in again, and as Gabby said, man, was it a wait. Uh, we're supposed to have gone into theater at 2 o'clock. We went in at 5 o'clock, finally. I stayed overnight, had to stay overnight, and they cleared out. What's that thing called, Gabby? Gabby! The circumflect artery. So, I'm the bionic man. <laughs> Two years ago, they cleared the right artery, which was 100% blocked. Uh, a week ago, they did the left artery, the widow maker, which was also 100% blocked. And then they went in and did the circumflect, and that was completely blocked. Uh, there's a few small arteries at the bottom that they don't want to touch because it's too uh, dangerous. So I'm here and my ears aren't unblocked. No, I yell to the Lord. <laughs> Lord, we have Pete and repeat. <laughs> but I'm good for another 20,000 miles. So. And you know when they, when they fix an old car and they... They get it going again, they do an overhaul and stuff. There's always little things that they don't, they can't attend to. Well, that's me, but I'm good for another 20,000 miles, so you're, gonna, you're stuck with me for a while. But let's get serious for a moment. Today's the 21st anniversary of 9-11. And so I want us to just quietly just pray for a moment, just bow your heads, and you pray for those that lost their lives and for those families who still face, many of them I was reading the other day, still face many challenges. And so, Father, we just lift up uh, the families of those who lost their lives on 9-11. And Lord, I know that every single one of us remember exactly where we were when that happened. And we give you honor and glory that we have the ability to gather in your name this morning. We pray for those families that you will continue to comfort them and give them the answers that they need. I pray, Lord, that they would come to a place of renewal and understanding of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let me tell you what we're doing. We're going to be looking at Psalm 122, and you can go and read Psalm 133 and 134 because they almost uh, speak about the same thing. Next week, I will finish this four-part series when I talk on Psalm 128 and 129. I encourage you to go and read that. It's an amazing psalm where it talks also, well, it talks specifically about the family then, and that's why I want to deal with that. And then we're going to get on to the book of Revelations, and I'm looking forward to that. And uh, that would be maybe a six or a seven part series, depending on uh, how it unfolds for me. And I used the example in the last two weeks of that movie, Grand Canyon, in my first message and then also in my second, because there's a phrase that I use that introduced the series. And it was Danny Glover who was the truck driver, the tow truck driver, and he said this, man, the world ain't supposed to work like this. Everything is supposed to be different than it is. And, you know, we can all look around. We can see the, all the different things that are unsettling, whether it's the politics, which seems to be a disaster, whether it's CRT and the schools for others, for others it's the violence, you just name it, but there is something unsettling for each person as we look out there. Most can't quite put their finger on it, but just about everything seems to unsettle us in one way or the other. 
So what do we do? There's only one answer to that, and that is we lean more into God than we ever before, because God is the only one who has the solution. If you go and read 2 Timothy 3 from verse 1, you'll see that he talks about in the last days. Go and have a look what that says. So today we're going to look at Psalm 122. And as I have said, that the Psalms of Ascent have an upward motion. They begin in Psalm 120 with the psalmist crying out in trouble or far away from Jerusalem. And they end at Psalm 134 with the psalmist offering up praise in the temple courts. So the Psalms have an upward motion and a down motion. And if you break the 15 Psalms into five groups of three, you'll notice a pattern for each of the three groups. The first Psalm in each group focuses on the trouble of some sort. The second one focuses on trust. And the third Psalm in each group focuses on triumph or victory. For example, as I said, Psalm 120 begins with a psalmist uh, repenting. Psalm 121, as we looked at last week, uh, puts his trust in God. In Psalm 122, he gathers with God's people for worship in the temple. The pattern of trouble, trust, triumph is, repeats itself in Psalms 123 to 125, Psalms 126 to 128, Psalms 139 to 131, and then Psalms 132 to 138, 134, sorry. And I have a grid there for you that you can take a look at. Uh, if you're online, you can download the outline and uh, join with us this morning. Each group of the three psalms begins, as I said, with the psalmist in trouble and then moves upward towards victory. The pattern repeats in the next three psalms, although each time the psalm of trouble starts a little higher than the one before. And so as you work your way through the psalms uh, of ascent, you actually get a very realistic view of what it means to be a Christian, a realistic view of the Christian's journey in life. And it's not always all the way up, but often three steps forward, one step back. It's a progress in fits and starts, but it is progress nonetheless. You know, one of the afflictions of pastoral work is, has been to listen with a straight face uh, to all the reasons people give for not coming to church. You know, excuses like, my mother made me do it when I was little and I don't feel like it now. There are too many hypocrites in the church. And, you know, it's the only day I can sleep in. And I can also, you know, just as well meet God in nature. I used to respond to such statements with simple arguments that exposed them as flimsy excuses, but, you know, it didn't make any difference. If I showed one inadequacy of an excuse, three more would pop up, and so I just gave up that. So I don't respond anymore. I listen and go home and pray that one day they may find sufficient reason for going to church, for coming to meet with God. And I go about my work praying that what I do and what I say, that the Holy Spirit will use it to create a determination to worship God in community. Many people do. They decided to worship God faithfully and devoutly, and it is one of the most important acts in the life of a disciple. As I said, Psalm 122 is the third sequence of a psalm, a psalm, a psalm of a person who decides to go to church and worship God. Psalm 122 is a sample of a complex, diverse, and worldwide phenomenon of worship that is common to all Christians. Think about it right now, that there are people in China who are worshiping God, maybe in a different time zone or different time, but at, when we meet at 10 o'clock, at 10 o'clock in their places of worship, they are meeting. And obviously with the, with the persecution there, they're probably meeting in small homes. If you think of Vietnam, or you think of India, or you think of Pakistan, or you think of Kenya, you think of Uganda, you think of South America, you know, Costa Rica or Brazil or wherever it is, people gather on a Sunday morning 
to worship God. And it's an excellent instance of what happens when people worship this Psalm 122. Psalm 120 is a song of repentance that where one gets out of an environment of deceit and hostility and sets ourselves on a path towards God. 121 is trust of our faith resists voodoo medicine remedies and all that gobbledygook that sometimes is even spoken from pul pulpits when faced with trials and tribulations and so trust in God that he will work it out and guard you from evil in the midst of difficulty. Earl spoke about that this morning. And so 122 is a psalm of worship. It is people of faith everywhere who gather together on an assigned place and worship their God. Verse 1 of Psalm 122 says, And when they said, Let us go to the house of God, my heart leapt with joy. Now that might catch us as Christians by surprise, but it shouldn't. Because worship is the most popular thing Christians do. A great deal of Christian behavior previously had become part of our legal system. You look at the founding of our country. You look at the laws that were put in place. It was part of the behavior, and it became part of our legal system embedded in our social expectations. But if we removed all the laws from society, eliminated all the consequences of antisocial acts, we don't know how much murder, how much theft, how much perjury and falsification would take place. But I want to stop there for a moment. We actually know what is happening when laws are removed, when laws of constraint that are put in are removed. Just look at the consequences of defund the police in, major, in many major cities around the country. I mean, look at Seattle and Portland and Chicago and New York and California as prime examples of what's going on when laws aren't enforced. These cities and states are in chaos. I'm not going to rehearse all the statistics because you can go and Google them for yourself. But you know, the absence of God brings lawlessness. And that's what we're seeing in so many of our cities today. Worship, however, also is not a forced thing. We worship because we want to. Of course, Maybe when you were going up, growing up, or maybe your spouse, when you first started coming to church, uh, made you come, quote unquote, made you come because they had decided that you need to be here. And well, let me say this to you. It's a good thing when you force your kids to come to church. Amen. 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 But these co coercions are short-lived, a few years at most. Most of worship is voluntary. An excellent way to test people's values is to observe what they do when they don't have to do anything. You had a choice this morning. Every single one of you had a choice to do something different today. You could have gone hiking. You could have just slept away in bed. And you know, there's 101 things that you could have done today. And so an excellent way to test people's values is to observe what they do when they don't have to do anything, when no one is watching. Even in a time when individuals' church attendance is not on the upswing in the United States, the numbers are impressive. Let me explain what I'm saying. There are more people at worship today on any given Sunday, for instance, than at a football game or watching golf or fishing or whatever. You take the cumulative average of what's happening in the churches today in America, we are more of us worshiping than watching any football game you'd like to. Even if there's 100,000, we have far more in the churches today worshiping their God. Amen. Cumulatively, worship is the most popular act in this country. So when you hear the psalmist say, let's go to the house of God, my heart leapt with joy. We're not listening to some phony enthusiasm of a propagandist drumming up business for worship. It is typical for most Christians in places at most time. It is not an exception to which we aspire. It is the instance of the average.
average. The average person, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you have, whether you have not, whatever your education, the aspiration of Christians is come to the house of the Lord to worship him. And so why do we do this? Why is there so much voluntary and faithful worship by Christians? Let me ask you this. Why is it that you never find a Christian life without in the background somewhere an act of worship? Never find a Christian community where you don't find Christian worship. Why is it that worship is, the common, in, in, is common in the Christian experience and that it is willingly and faithfully practiced? The psalm, sing, the psalm singles out three items. Worship, number one, gives us a workable structure for life. Worship nurtures our need to be in relationship with God. When you come to church together and you begin to worship together with the other saints, it builds you up. It gives us a workable structure for our lives. And secondly, uh, it also worship centers on our attention, our attention on the decisions of God. Worship, as I said, gives us a workable structure. What do I mean by that? Verse 3 and 4, Jerusalem, well-built city, built as a place for worship, the city to which the tribes ascend, all God's people go up to worship. Now, just a little bit of background. Jerusalem was the geographical center of the country. Not only the geographical center, but it was the political seat of authority and it was the place for the Hebrews to go at least three times a year to honor God. When you went to Jerusalem, you encountered the great foundational realities that God created for you, that God redeemed you, that God provided for you. In Jerusalem, you saw the, in ritual and heard in proclamation the preaching of, the, of a powerful history the shaping truth that God has for each one of us, where he's forgiven our sins and made it possible to live without guilt and to have a purpose in God. In Jerusalem, all the scattered fragments of experience, all the bits and pieces of truth and feeling and perception are put together. The King James Version translates this into a sentence. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. The city was a kind of architectural metaphor for what worship is. All the pieces of masonry fit compactly together. All the stones put ideally in its place. No loose stones, no leftover pieces, no gaps in the walls or towers. It was compactly built, skillfully built, at unity with itself. Now, two scriptures, you don't have it on your outline, but it's Acts chapter 4, verse 10 and 11, out of the New International Version. And then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. This, that this man stands before you healed. And Jesus said, it goes on, the stone you builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone of our worship, of this body that we have here today. In Psalm 133 from verse 1, it says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of the garment. And as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that is descended upon the mountain of Zion, for there the Lord commanded his blessing forevermore. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. So, what is true architecturally is also true socially. The sentence continues, to which the tribes ascend with all God's people. In worship, all the different tribes functioning as a single person in harmonious relationship. And though we come from different places and out of different conditions, we are demonstrably after the same thing, saying the same things, 
and doing the same things. With all our different levels of education, wealth, background, and language, in worship, we are gathered together. We're all the same at the foot of the cross. Quarrels, misunderstandings, and differences pale into insignificance as the unity of which God builds in the act of worship is demonstrated. I know that as I look across this, this particular congregation, there are people from every tribe, every nation, that come together from every educational level, that come together to worship God. And there is no difference amongst us. All the parts are there. Nothing is left out. Nothing is left out of proportion. Everything fits into a workable frame. One time, the person I went to see, she was sitting at a window doing her embroidery on a piece of cloth that was held taut by an oval hoop. I'm sure you know what those are. I don't think they do much of that today, but that's... I went to see this person, and she said, Pastor, while waiting for you to come, I realized what's wrong with me. I do not have a frame. My feelings, my thoughts, my activities, everything is loose and sloppy. There's no border in my life. I never know where I am. I need a frame for my life like this one. Would you please pray with me? Without Jesus, there is no frame. People aren't constrained. They live like they want to, how they feel. So how do we get that frame, the solid structure, so that we know where we stand and therefore able to work easily and without anxiety? Christians, we as Christians go to worship week by week. We enter the place compactly built to which the tribes ascend. And so to get a working definition for our lives. You already have the definition for this week. You need to just take a look at your life and say, well, is my life framed with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is that what I use? Is the gospel what I use as my framework for living out there in the world? And so worship is a place where we obey the commandment to praise God, to give thanks to the name of God. It is what... Israel meant when they said we're going up. It's what we mean as Christians. When we sin, mess up our lives, we find that does, God doesn't go off and leave us. He enters into our troubles and he saves us. I mean, can you not just think how wonderful that is? That if I think back on my life this last week, I know there must be instances where I stumbled and where I fell, where I didn't hit the mark that I wanted to hit, where I didn't fulfill what God wanted me to fulfill, but yet I know He forgives me. St. Augustine said, Praise God, a Christian should be an alleluia from head to foot. God made us, He redeemed us, He provides for us, and so the natural, honest, healthy, logical response is to praise God. When we praise, we are functioning at the center, completely in touch with the basic core and the reality of our being. We want to, not because we're forced to. I've never said that we worship because we feel like it. We worship whether we feel like it or not, because feelings are great liars. We live with the sifting, shifting sands of emotion like a desert, I don't know if you've ever seen the slow motion of the deserts of the Sahara, how they just, the mountain would form of sand and then slowly it would dissipate and then another one would form. That's what our emotions are like, folks. And if we based our Christian walk on the way we felt, well, that would be a sad state of affairs. We cannot base our Christianity and us coming to church to worship God on how we feel. If Christians worship only when they feel like it, there would be precious little worship. Feelings are important in many areas, but completely unreliable in the matter of faith. Someone once wrote this. He said, the Bible wastes very little time on the way we feel. We live in what one writer called the, the age of sensation. We, 
We sometimes think that if we don't feel something, it cannot be authentic. The wisdom of God says something completely different. That we can act ourselves into a new way of feeling much quicker than we can feel ourselves into a new way of acting. Worship is an act that develops feelings for God. Not a feeling for God that is expressed in an act of worship. And so I say to you, when you come here on a Sunday morning, you might not feel like it, but get involved in the worship. When we obey the command to praise God and worship, our deep, essential need to be in relationship with our God is nurtured. Third reason we keep engaging our regular acts of worship is that our attention is centered on the decisions of God. Let me explain. Our psalm describes worship where the place of where, where thrones for righteous judgment are set. What does that mean? The word judgment means the decisive word by which God straightens out things and puts things in first place, or puts things in place. Thrones of judgment are places where the word of God is announced. Judgment is the word that does things, putting love into motion, applying mercy, nullifying wrong, and ordering goodness. In the call to worship, we hear God's first word to us. In the benediction, as you will read, we'll read at the end of the service, we hear God's last word to us. In the scripture lesson, we hear God speaking to, to our faith parents. In sermon, we hear the word expressed to us. In the worship music, we are all to a greater or lesser extent uh, worshiping and singing and paraphrasing what scripture says. Every time we worship, our minds are informed, our memories are refreshed with the judgment of God, in which other word, the word of God. We are being familiarized with what God says, what he's decided, and the way we are to work out our salvation. There is simply no place that it can be done as well as with worship. If we stayed home by ourselves and read the Bible, we are going to miss a lot because our reading will be unconditioned, uncon unconsciously, sorry, conditioned by our culture, limited by our ignorance, and distorted by our unknown, unnoticed prejudices. Because you see, we all come from somewhere, and we've been formed by our past. And so when you read the Word of God for yourself, and I'm not saying you mustn't, obviously you must, because we must spend time in the Word of God. But, you know, we've got to be careful when we do that. We do not allow our prejudices, our unknown prejudices, to govern us. In worship, we are part with the congregation, with all the writers of Scripture which address us. Where the worship music uh, writers use music to express truth that not only touches in our head, but in our hearts. Where the preacher, me, has lived through six days of doubt, hurt, faith, and, and blessing with the worshipers. And he speaks truth of the scripture in a language which the current or the congregation currently is experiencing. Worship is the place where my attention is centered on the personal and decisive words of God, expressed to us in hymns and songs and are all, to a greater or lesser extent, paraphrased in Scripture. Now, we heard Earl this morning exhort us that he gave a testimony for 15 years. He was waiting for the miracle. But when he turned his mind around and he said, Lord, I'm waiting on you. I'm paraphrasing you now. <laughs> he turned his mind around and he's now waiting on God. God began to do what he had requested of God to do. And so that's what we do here when we worship together. Now I want you to listen very carefully to the next few minutes. And you see it on your outline, how worship rewires our brains and bonds us together. Scientific data suggests that singing in community reshapes our physical selves and our corporate connections. I want to tell you, that's why I had to be here this morning. 
didn't matter how I felt. I wanted to be with my brothers and sisters. I wanted a hug. I wanted to even have a cup of coffee. My wife said I couldn't have coffee this morning, so I didn't, so I didn't sneak it. I had a, a, some herbal tea. He has my tea bag for after the service. <laughs> but I wanted to be with the saints and I wanted to worship together because I know it would lift my spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's pleasure to work not just in our heads and in our hearts, but in and through our bodies to form us wholly into Christ's body. And because the Spirit is the author of all things natural, not only supernatural, the scientists offer invaluable insights regarding the unique power of communal song to corporately unite us together as Christians. In our relationally fraught and difficult times today, that is good news. Scientists have come up with these two, with two issues which are called entertainment and interactional synchronity. And let me explain. The definition of entertainment is the synchronization of our rhythmic process with one another. Now that sounds a whole bunch of big words, but let me just break it down for you. In other words, it describes the way the body gradually syncs with one another or with the external rhythm, often unconsciously. When you begin to worship and you see somebody clapping their hands, what do we do? Good, but we normally clap, don't we? We normally clap together. Even my granddaughter, she was up here in the front and she was clapping in rhythm because there's that, that, that thing that happens in corp, in, corporately to each one of us. And so have you not noticed that when there's a song that we like, we start tapping our feet and everybody also around you taps their feet. That's what the scientists are saying. And what does that do for you and I as Christians? Entertainment happens at all time in corporate worship. A particularly catchy song, for instance, may, as I said, cause somebody and then somebody next to you and somebody next to you and somebody behind you to tap their feet. You might see people bobbing their heads together in a synchronized way or at a worship concert, a massive audience might find itself clapping at the exact same tempo without, unconscious, without consciously uh, intending to. These phenomena are examples of mutual entrainment. Now, I don't know, the other day I was watching some or other thing that was happening in a village in Africa. And I was watching this whole tribe, it was a small tribe, it was not tribe, but this whole village come together and they started pounding the drums and guess what happened? Every single one of them together started stomping their feet and moving. What is that? That's inter entrainment together. Together there was something that they associated with. There was God for us, God, but for them it was what they were the beat, the drums, the, the history of who they were as a tribe coming together in one place at one time and reenacting it. That's what we do when we come together and worship God. Amen. Amen? And then there's this other thing, the idea of interactional synchronity. It's similar to entertainment, but it draws specific attention to what occurs when people mirror each other through bodily and vocal movements. For example, when a mother smiles, her baby smiles. When a mother frowns, her baby frowns. When she stops speaking, what will happen many times is her baby will become still. The same thing is true for two persons who make music together. Have you not watched them? They'll sit down and they'll start drumming, strumming on the guitar and the guy next to him who's strumming on another guitar, they'll start going like this. Eh? Or you're playing the piano and the guy next to you 
who's on the guitar starts going like that. He starts tapping his foot. There's a mirroring of what happens, and that's what happens when we worship together. We begin to mirror somebody else. Somebody will start by clapping their hands, and guess what we do? We're not going to get left out, and so we clap our hands as well. And that's what's so wonderful about the believers gathering together. You see, unfortunately, though what happens is these experiences are difficult, if not impossible, to achieve over Zoom. Partly because of the half-second delay that usually marks those kinds of exchanges, and because rather than being directly accessible to one another, our bodies are being mediated by a phone or computer. My point is this. Over against the idea that the Spirit works in exclusively invisible and immaterial ways in, in the singing ministry of the church, I, I believe that the Spirit produces one body, the life of the church, in and through our physical selves. That's why, folks, it is absolutely important for us together as a body of believers. The Spirit takes our corporate songs and binds them corporately in a way that is deeply transformational for each one of us. How many of you remember that song by Kerry Job and her husband? What was her name? The Blessing. Remember when that first came out? I don't know about you, but when that song first came out, it stirred something in my spirit. And it stirred something in my spirit not only for myself, but it stirred something in my spirit for the generations that follow me. And when I was singing the blessing or croaking the blessing, <laughs> When I was trying to sing the blessing, maybe that's the better way. When I was trying to sing the blessing, I was thinking of my children and my grandchildren. And as I was worshiping God, I was blessing them as well. Amen. Unfortunately, what has happened, because oftentimes when these songs or this worship is so often used so many times, that it just becomes another song. And one other thing, and I have, a, I have something to say about this. As you know, I have lots of things to say about lots of things. <laughs> but a lot of times, some of the music that we call worship is absolutely nonsense. It might be a catchy tune. It might get our feet uh, stomping and our hands clapping. But there's absolutely no value in it for us corporately, for us spiritually, and, well, moving on. So, what about those people who are under duress and persecution, who cannot gather in person? What about the sick and the homebound? What about the disabled and the uh, immunocompromised and the elderly in nursing homes? Oh, by the way, on Thursday, I had my 15th COVID test. I think I must be the most COVID-tested pastor in the world. <laughs> they, wouldn't let me, they wouldn't let me in the hospital on Friday if I had not been COVID-tested. So, shh. So, Zoom or live streamed worship is an extraordinary gift and one that previous generations didn't enjoy. And you know, I'm thankful that we, we had that during COVID. But if you know, we opened up the church. We closed it down and just quickly thereafter, we opened it up again. Do you know why? Because I recognize the need for us to be together. You see... And I've said this to you before, and I've said it, and I won't say, repeat it because now the danger is gone. I've often said that when the police would come in, would have come in, if 
during COVID times, and Gabby was standing at the back, I was in the front, I'd say, well, she's the pastor here, I'm just the guest speaker. <laughs> Shh. Gather together. The Spirit of God will coordinate people who may find themselves profoundly out of sync with one another, whether theologically, politically, or otherwise. So, the experience of interaction, no, getting together heightens our ability to be emotionally and relationally attuned to one another. It serves the purpose of forging bonds across all kinds of cultural divides and familial and ethnic and theological um, differences. And you know what? I don't know about you. Isn't it wonderful that when you get together and somebody's in the front of the church over there in the foyer and she comes up to you with a grin that is this big and says, thank you for being here. And maybe even give you a hug. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a touchy-feely dude. But that, that gets to me. That reinforces who I am as a person. And as a Christian, that there's a fellow believer there who wants to say hello to me with everything that they are. They're expressing Christ to me in their greeting to me. And so what we need to do and need to understand that gathering together in one place is not always possible. And so many, so my challenge and the worship team's challenge, and even your challenge is that we need to be more inclusive of everyone who might be watching online. We have people from San Francisco and from Arizona and from Saudi Arabia and from South Africa and from Germany and from the Philippines who watch us every week. They can't fly here every week for a, for a service. And so we need to try and figure out how we can be more inclusive for those people. And I want to tell those people how much we appreciate them, how much we appreciate them taking the time in all different time zones to join us on a Sunday morning and so that we could worship together. And so finally, worship is an intentional looking up, a stepping out of the world's winds and into the Spirit's winds. In worship, we fill our time, our minds, our spirits, our mouths, not just with an activity for God, but with the character and substance of God himself. Jehoshaphat, they had a consultation when all the armies were gathered around them. In 2 Chronicles 20, they said, after consulting the people, the king, that was Jehoshaphat, appointed singers to walk ahead of the army singing to the Lord and praising Him for His holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Amnon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting amongst themselves. When they began to worship the Lord, Worshipping was not just a duty, it is a weapon. When they began, what do you think the, the armies of the enemy that were gathered around them began to think when they heard the people of God, when they heard the Israelites begin to worship? Satan was about to steal, kill, and destroy them, but when they began to worship, the armies were in disarray. Worship is the warring posture for God's people. Looking up in worship seems to be a powerful posture for advancing forward. And so my encouragement to you today, and I'll close with this, my encouragement for you today is if you're facing a trial, if you're facing something in your life, if it's relationship, if it's financial, if it's in your employment, if it's with your husband, your wife, whatever it is, whatever situation you might be facing, yes, you can wallow in your own self-pity. Or 
You can change your posture and look up to God and begin to worship Him because then I promise you the circumstances will change. And as we are looking up, we are inhabiting a space that will change. Our praises stack together, weave and collaborate, and we become the body of Christ. And so what I want us to do now when the worship team comes, I want us to begin to worship God, but I want to encourage you and I want to invite you to do something this morning. I want you, as the Spirit of God might lead you, to go to somebody this morning. Now, you don't have to do it, obviously, but as the Spirit of God may lead, I'd like you to go to somebody and put your, arm, with their, your hand on their shoulder and just join them in worship today. Just for a moment, put your hand on their shoulder, pray with them. I know that's intimidating to some of you, but you know, break free, break loose, and begin to minister to somebody else in worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we thank you that as the psalm started, where it says, let's go up to the house of God, we have come to worship you today in Jesus' name. We thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that as we come, we come into this entrainment where we begin to worship together where you lift us and you lift our spirits by that which we do when we worship you in oneness and in one accord. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope I hear your voice.